fellow story lovers. You have been listening to the musical stylings of Aaron Bates, and we'll be hearing a lot more from him throughout the evening. Thank you, Aaron. My name is David Levy, and I am the co-founder of True Theater and tonight's MC. Joining us behind the scenes tonight is our technical director, friend, and fellow board member, Jackson Short, turning on and off cameras and microphones, and also our production manager and personal friend of mine for nearly 30 years, Annette Uchi, calling cues and doing a ton of work to help us get ready for this evening. I don't even know what we did without her. Uh, thank you both for being with us tonight. And thank you, everybody who's watching us live stream this storytelling event tonight. I see a lot of you in the attendees list. Many of you uh, have been here before, some of you many times. Appreciate you coming back. I also see some of you lining up and watching from, I got the little Facebook feed going right over here so I can keep an eye on that as well. Thank you all for joining us. If this is a new type of event for you, if you are here for the first time, you are in for a real treat, a doggy treat. Since 2010, we have been producing quarterly evenings just like this, each featuring five people uh, who we find from just anywhere we could find them, telling true personal stories based on the theme of the evening. In the future, maybe you could be telling one of those stories. As you must know by now, the theme of the evening tonight is dogs. We did an animal themed show several years ago and we got several dog submissions to that particular evening. So I knew that this day would come uh, when my fiance Jennifer and I got our Shih Tzu Poodle Mix Rosie that you may have seen on the show poster for this show a uh, couple of years ago. I, I began to suspect this day may come sooner rather than later. And sure enough, here it is. And we've got five great stories for you here tonight. Uh, let's see. I love Rosie. Oh, I was going to make a Rosie joke, but I screwed up the timing. So I'm just going to move on. If you joined us uh, earlier this evening, you probably saw a, like just as we started streaming, a contest up on the screen in which Zoom participants, that is people joining us here in the Zoom meeting, uh, can uh, win a coffee mug just like this one, but with this show's emblem on it and your name right there, just by answering the question on the screen. It looks like we got maybe nine participants and Jackson's gonna be figuring out who the winner of that one is. And we'll announce that a little later in the show. Uh, we will also have a contest taking place during our brief four minute intermission that we'll be having tonight and also one on your way out the door. So stick around all the way to the end to participate in those. Uh, we love giving away these personalized mugs. People seem to love to give, get them. And uh, if you're watching from Facebook and thinking, man, I wish I was in the Zoom audience. How did I not know about this? Well, be sure to get on our mailing list and register early when you hear about this Zoom meeting. Actually, I guess registering early doesn't do a thing because it's not first register, first serve. It's a first in the room, first serve. If you tried to get in tonight and you ended up watching it on Facebook because you couldn't, we're really sorry. There's only room for 100 people in the webinar. So thank you for registering. Make sure to get on our mailing list. And if you just want to hear all the news that's fit to print, be sure that you follow us on all of our social media streams. That includes Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Instagram. And pretty much we're known as at True Theater on all of them. Notice we spell theater the fancy way, ending in an R-E. So uh, look for us on all those and be sure to uh, like, share, subscribe, follow, whatever it is on your social media stream of choice and get all the news that's fit to print uh, as soon as we have it for you to print. Uh, dip, 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 dip. Moving on. We continue to be ecstatic that we can offer you these virtual shows for free while we all wait out the lockdown. And uh, you should know, however, that um, we do have expenses and they help us keep the lights on. So if, if you are so inclined, and please do not feel any pressure to do this, uh, no matter how many times I may mention this tonight, uh, uh, we'd rather you enjoy these stories and feel any awkwardness around this, but if you are so inclined, there is a way you can donate to True Theater this evening by texting TRUE11 to the number 44321. You'll get a link back that you can follow and then fill in your donation about amount. Um, some people give $10, but seriously, no amount is too small. And I'm not gonna lie, no amount is too big. Try us. Oh, wait, I just thought of an amount. No, that's not too big either. So whatever you want to do, and of course, if you don't want to do nothing, we are just stoked that you are here because we've got great stories. And, you know, we always say it takes two people to tell a story, one to tell it and one to listen. And we need you here to do that.
do that listening. So thank you for joining us tonight. We'll have that number again on the screen for you later, TRUE11, T-R-U-E-1-1, and you can text that to 44321 if you want to donate. But now, the reason we are all here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we always say at True Theater that everybody has a story to tell, and the only difference between a stranger and a friend is the sharing of that story, and tonight you're going to make five new friends. The first of whom is a professor of electronic media and broadcasting at the College of Informatics at Northern Kentucky University, focusing on media aesthetics, digital cinema, and international media production. Professionally, he's also a producer, writer, director, and editor. Personally, he's Kim's husband and Zoa's dad, and blessed to be the human to three canine family members over the years who are the subjects of his story tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chris Strobel. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Dogs. You know, there's, there's something about dogs. And I think that if you let it, the universe or God, if you need to anthropomorphize the universe, tends to provide the dog that you need in your life. But it doesn't just happen. You have to be open to it. I've always been a dog person my whole life. Well, full disclosure, there was a time in college where I experimented with cats, but, well, one cat, Nightfall. Anyway, black on top, white paws. It's a whole different story. When my wife, Kim, and I got married, we knew a family was far in the future. So when, as newlyweds, we moved into a rental house, we went to the local shelter and we found a little black and white uh, dog to join our family. Her coloring was not unlike Nightfall's. We named her Deopia after a nymph from one line of the Aeneid. You're gonna find that we don't go with normal names. Deopia, Meme, Gobo, we'll, we'll get to all that. Um, you could tell that Deopia had lived through some things. She was timid, she was quiet. She was this calm little dog for us to love and to nurture. And then we gave her a bath and that little dog became unleashed. I mean, it's as if that unpleasant experience for her also told her that we wanted her, that we would take care of her, that she was safe, that she belonged, and she ran laps around the house, and she shook water everywhere. She was shown love, she was shown compassion, and that allowed her true self to come out. And her transformation from this sweet meekness to energetic swagger it kind of reflected the new life that we were all having together. We were exploring, we were searching, we were poking our noses into new and exciting things professionally and personally. And the Opie was kind of the personification of that. She was the personification of the, a little dog with this big dog attitude. We would tell other people that unless their dogs immediately acknowledge her dominance, she didn't like bigger dogs than her. And when the humans didn't listen, once I had to smack her on the nose to get her to release her bite on the snout of a Doberman pincher. I mean, seriously, she was hanging there and swinging. She was in charge and Doberman was okay too. But in a lot of ways, she was our kid and she acted like it. She was the first dog that my mom allowed, allowed inside of her house. Growing up, our pets had all been outside animals. And I think that Deopia knew that that was kind of a big deal. And when we moved to DC for graduate school, she moved with us, of course, and she loved city life with all the noises and all the energy. And just like a kid, she loved snow and the East Coast snow. Oh, well, once we had three feet, at least, of snow outside of our apartment, and it was all crusty on, on the top. And she got up on it and she started walking on that crusty part. And then, boom, she fell inside. And Kim and I looked at each other and we're like, oh, what do we do? And then suddenly she crawls out and she jumps out and she's got this huge, doggy smile on her face, and it was just joy. That's what we all felt. A few years later, we moved to Cincinnati. We adopted our daughter, Zoa, and suddenly Deopia had a 10-month-old running around, trying to hug her and stumbling into her, which she tolerated. But by then, she was an old dog. She was somewhere around 15 years old. This was a very new trick, and our family dynamics had changed. 
It was almost as if Deopia knew that her pack had evolved. And four months after we brought Zoa home from China, we were visiting my parents for Christmas and Deopia's kidneys failed. And as sad as that was, it was nice to be able to bury her on their cemetery hill right next to nightfall in the Indiana countryside. It's her favorite place on earth. Our family of three got to know each other for a while and we were a happy threesome. Um, but then one of the women my wife worked with insisted that Zoe needed a puppy and it's the year of the dog. And so Kim says, all right, if you find one that's the same size as the day, Opie, remember she's small, like 15 pounds. We'll take a look. And the next day, I mean, literally the next day, there's a dog, like a brown Deopia that was abandoned in my vet. You need to go meet her. So we went to visit and yeah, we went home with a new dog, a new dog that was twice as big as our prior dog. And when May May arrived, it was like the second coming of pre-bath Deopia. But this time a bath didn't change her demeanor. I think the universe knew that we already had our hands full as new parents. And they, the universe provided the most gentle, calm, loving dog. And our daughter's a dancer and she has been from day one. She's a flurry of energy. And so I would literally flop down on top of Mei Mei, who would raise her hand, head to look at this little girl, hugging her tight and she'd maybe give her a kiss. They were what each other needed. I should probably define Mei Mei's name. We knew that our daughter was gonna be an only child. And so to reinforce that thought, we named the dog the word for little sister in Mandarin, Mei Mei, and it worked. Mei Mei was probably the gentlest, kindest, most gen genuine soul, human or canine that I've ever met. She never barked, she could, but unless completely provoked, she lived in silent happiness. She loved our family. She was truly only happy when we were all together. She understood our family structure to be my wife is the alpha dog. My daughter was her sibling and I was her child. And she loved, and she loved to take care of me. She would clean me continuously licking my head, my face, especially my ears. I mean, I was spotless. My wife's daughter, my wife and daughter's best friends are also mother daughter. And when our families would travel, we would watch each other's dogs and May May loved them, but she would only sit at the front window watching, waiting for us to return. They took to putting her bed by that window so she could just spend the day waiting for our car to pull up because that, when our family, when our pack was together, that's when she was truly happy. Mamie showed us how much family matters. She made us better people as she completed our family, which ultimately is actually a little bit amazing since during a little bit of reminiscing about how Mamie came to join our family, my wife, my wife and I realized that we each thought that the other wanted to adopt a dog all those years ago. But in reality, neither of us thought we were ready, but the universe knew what we did not. At that point in our lives, we needed that example of complete and unconditional love. In December, 2019, 14 years after we adopted her, Mei Mei's kidneys gave, gave out. And maybe the hardest thing I've ever done, one of the most important things I've ever done, is to be with her at the moment when she slipped away from the world. I, I won't ever forget being nose to nose, looking in her eyes as she faded away. A real void accompanied me, so I wrapped her in her favorite blanket and carried her to our backyard and buried her on the crest of the hill, her own personal kind of cemetery hill. It's a place where she loved to stand and let the breeze bring all the smells in the neighborhood to her. May May died just before the world changed. COVID was emerging. And as the world shut down, we, like many families, decided our family was maybe a dog short, but this time it was different. We made the decision about adoption with open eyes, full discussion. And we started looking around and for one reason or another, there was just a number of near misses and it was frustrating. I mean, but then after a month or so, the universe smiled on us one more time and the Cincinnati SPCA had a blue healer, an Australian sheepdog, the most purebred dog we've ever had in our family. People used to ask me what kind of dog Mamie was and I'd say, brown. And as, but as soon as we knew, met her, we knew that we had found Gobo. And again, I should probably define the name. Gobo's a media term. I teach filmmaking at the NKU. And it's a device that creates a pattern of shadow. And if you've ever seen a blue healer, you'll recognize that. Her pattern kind of looks like a real discombobulated Dalmatian. 
Gobo is about the same size of Mei Mei, and while she is much more vocal, probably a little bit smarter, she has the same soft empathy to her heart. Our dog sitter friend's son noticed this immediately and said that she has Mei Mei's spirit, and that's true. But Gobo is more a dog of these times. She's a bit headstrong. She's a little bit more insistent about her needs. She loves food, don't we all? And she enjoys her active time. During this COVID isolation, my daughter usually uh, does her high school studies upstairs. My wife works downstairs and everybody's on their own space. And so at just the right intervals, Gobo will go in between each of us and assure that we are taking breaks from all those screens to focus solely on another member of our family. And maybe we'll even play for a while. Like Mei Mei, Gobo is the happiest when we're all together, when her pack is together. Well, she's probably happiest when she's destroying a Nerf Frisbee or running around with me outside, but she expresses her happiness when we get home and she greets us all in our own way. She'll wag her tail enthusiastically at my wife or she'll, as she rubs her behind her ears or she'll nuzzle with my daughter or she'll rise up on her hind legs and lean into me and then kiss me. And once that's done, that's when she'll finally dig out the treat that she's had with her all day long. Her family is home, safe, healthy. And that's all she needs. Compassion breeds love. Belonging builds self-worth. Togetherness brings happiness. When we let them, I think our dogs show us how life can be, how life should be. I don't believe in fate that things happen for a reason or there's some preordained plan for everyone's life. But I'm not unconvinced that a dog isn't the mirror image of God. And I do believe that when you're patient and you're open to it, the universe gives you what you need. And when you're really lucky, the universe provides you with a dog. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chris. You know, Chris and family's decision to do, adopt a dog during the pandemic is not uncommon. Uh, shortages of dogs and shelters have been reported. And according to a survey done recently by Rover.com, 93% of people who adopted animals during lockdown said their pandemic pet improved their mental and or physical well-being in the last year. Over 80% said it made working from home and being at home during the pandemic more enjoyable. I'm glad, Chris, that you and your family have Gobo. It sounds like, in fact, the universe did get it right. Now, unlike Chris, who only dabbled with cats in college, our next storyteller has always been a cat guy, saying, calm and quiet pets are my thing. As is about to be evident, maybe when you don't like dogs, the universe Fs with you when you finally get one. Please give a sympathetic welcome to our returning blue-haired friend, Scott Howell. My sister Sandy once asked me if I'd ever met a Chihuahua, I didn't want to punt like a football. And all the way up to and including today, even this evening, that answer still remains no, no, I have not. Um, a blazing hot, uh, humid July afternoon finds us going to a campground. Uh, we got the travel trailer on the back of the pickup truck, and it's the three of us, uh, myself, my two daughters, Alice and Vivian, and their dog, 
Peanut. Peanut's their dog. We found Peanut at uh, the pound. I never, ever wanted him. Well, the day we found him at the pound, he was suspiciously quiet, suspiciously quiet, especially for uh, Chihuahua. Um, unfortunately, he was tiny, cute, scrawny five pounds, so he had the affection of three quarters of the family. My wife and two girls versus my one vote no, uh, I lost, and Peanut came home with us, and it took him about a week, and sure enough, he found his voice, that, that very obnoxious chihuahua little voice. Turns out I was right. <laughs> so we're driving north to a campground. It's about an hour north of where we live, and uh, parents out there know, you know, that's about 45 minutes too long for your six-year-old to not have to pee. So we quickly find a gas station, pull in, we're blocking everything, a big pickup truck and travel trailer. And, uh, I send the girls inside real quick uh, with the best of parental advice when you send them to a public restroom, don't touch anything, right? Wash your hands and don't touch anything. So off they run. I put the gas nozzle in the, in the gas tank and I top off the gas in the truck. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? A distraction for the girls to make the nice, to make the ride the rest of the, the campground nice and calm, normal, mellow. Uh, I'll get some uh, snacks out of the travel trailer. That'll keep them occupied the rest of the way. It'll be great. So I hop in a travel trailer. I get some pretzels and some potato chips and pop out. Come back around the trailer and go to open their door in the back of the truck and it's locked. And I think to myself, God, I can never get them to close the door, much less lock the darn thing. But I'll take it. It's a small win. I'll take whatever I can. And I reach for the driver's door. It too is locked. And instantly, as soon as I realized two doors were locked, oh my gosh, I knew exactly what I did. Inside the locked truck is a wiry little spring-loaded firecracker of an obnoxious chihuahua dancing up and down on the door, still so excited to see me having been gone out of sight for all of 60 seconds. And uh, he's locked the door. He's locked the door in a truck that's running, keys the ignition because I left the window up because the AC is on because I didn't want to cook the dog against my better judgment. Um, also inside the locked truck is my cell phone sitting on its charger. So now we're completely locked out of the truck and I'm devoid of any way to fix the situation or even ask for help. Um, Right about now, the girls come back from the gas station, from the um, from the bathroom, and uh, I tell them what their dog's done. And uh, not the proudest parental moment, have myself a little meltdown. And um, it's right then I remember uh, there's a, a special friend in my life, Mike, who reminds reminds me a little too often sometimes. When agitated, we pause, which is excellent advice for people like me. So we paused. I was very agitated. We paused a lot. We paused and we're pausing. We're pausing. And we find this little bit of shade and uh, we're sitting down there and we're gonna have a few snacks, try and figure out what we're gonna do here. And my oldest daughter, Alice, comes up with the greatest idea. Daddy, let's take some of the snacks and we'll dance them around in front of the window and we'll see if we can get Peanut to dance around and maybe hit the unlock button. And okay, great, that's not a bad idea. Proud parent moment number two at the gas station. And she's there and she's crying and he's jumping around and he's wiping his nose all over the window and he's all excited and he wants some potato chips and he wants salads and he wants us and he doesn't understand why we're not in the truck and he manages to hit the lock button about six more times but never can we get him over to the unlock button. Well now she feels she's failed so now she gets upset and we return to pausing because once again we're all agitated. And while we're you know calming down, this is good advice from my friend Mike, um, I try and capitalize on Alice's idea. I'll take some of the snacks. I'll go around to the other side of the truck at the back door. It only has one button. And all that does is operate the window. So maybe we can get them to dance around and hit that window button. So I grab some potato chips and some pretzels. And I'm standing out there. And I look like an idiot in front of everyone at the gas station. I'm dancing around trying to get the dog to do anything. And he's all excited jumping up and down. And he wants us to pet him. And he wants to go camping. And he wants the treats. And he doesn't know why we're not in the truck yet. And Luck finally takes a few minutes. Luck finally joins us. And he just barely touches the window button. And ping, just comes down just a couple inches. Maybe enough for me to get my hand into it. And not much more up to the rim. So I run around to the other side real quick. And I grab my little six-year-old daughter, Vivian. And uh, she's just old enough, just big enough, just long enough. Her arm fits down in there and reaches way down in just barely. She can touch that little lock bar 
on the door, ping, she's able to unlock the door. Oh my gosh, perhaps this is over. And we get into the truck and I run around to the driver's side and I get in my side of the truck. And uh, the dog jumps up on the console, very excited to see all of us and wants to be next to me and sit on my lap and look out the window and let's go camping. And I'm, you know, probably should be pausing again right now. And I turn around and I bing, just give him a friendly little elbow into the back seat with the girls. And I turn around and I say out loud to no one in particular, keep that effing dog the eff away from me. And, you know, off we go. And as uh, we carry on to the campground, I remember once again what my sister had asked me, if you ever met a chihuahua, Scott, you don't want to punt like a football. And as my commitment remains to punting chihuahuas, it was only a couple months, very brief months later, find myself in the same situation. I got the travel trailer in the back of the pickup truck. We're going to go camping. And this time it's just Peanut and I in the truck because the girls are at school. I take the day off and the girls are at school and my wife Jennifer's at work and she's going to get the girls later and they'll meet up later this evening. Well, down the road we go. I stop at a gas station because you got to have some L8 when you're camping in the state of Kentucky. Go into the gas station, come out. And this time I don't even need to play with the door. I can just see it because as I walk back to the truck, the thought finally occurred to me, oh no, what did we not learn last time? And you get there and sure enough, the little lock bar on the driver's side door, ping, sitting down in the hole, oh no. Sure enough, I try all four doors, nothing works. The dog has locked me out yet again. And this time he knows he's done bad, so he stays away from me on the other side of the truck. Regardless what door I stand at, which side of the truck I'm on, he makes sure to stand completely as far away from me as possible. He knows he's done bad. And this time, boy, did it take a lot of pausing because I don't need it that I'd even call it agitated at that point. <laughs> and I paused for a solid couple hours. This was a long one. This is a long lesson learned here. And uh, two, two and a half hours later, the gas station owner finally comes out and he's got some tools in his hand and we're able to break into the truck. And uh, true to his nature, the dog remains as far away from me as possible because he knows he's done bad. But I get into the truck and off we go. It was probably for the best because who knows, that may have been the day where I truly did punt a chihuahua much like a football. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Scott, <laughs> both for your story and for being a longtime fan and friend of True Theater. Uh, if I may, I think it's about time you buy yourself a vehicle with a keyless ignition so you can keep the keys in your pocket or perhaps punt the chihuahua. I don't know. <laughs> Probably the keyless ignition will be uh, keep you in good stead with the family. Uh, before we bring out our next storyteller tonight, uh, we wanted to announce the winner or the winners of our first contest this evening. Uh, the people who identified the most breeds of dog on the opening screen. For those of you just tuning in, here are those dogs again, but with the answers showing, uh, the two of you who got all five right are now patting yourselves on the back. The winners tonight are Charmaine Kessinger and Cheryl Beardsley. So congratulations to you both. I should point out that more than one person guessed Maltese instead of Shih Tzu and Boston Terrier instead of French Bulldog. So you're all in good company, but congrats again to Charmaine and Cheryl. Uh, there will be two more contests later in the evening for you, the rest of you to win some mugs. Uh, folks, if you've been enjoying what you're experiencing here this evening, don't forget that uh, if you are so inclined, you can make a donation to True Theater uh, by texting the number right here on the screen, the, the text TRUE11 true 11 to the phone number 44. Three, two, one. What happens is you get a, uh, a link back that you click and it takes you to the site and you could enter whatever value of donation you want to do there. Again, um, absolutely no pressure. Just want to make the opportunity available to you if you are again so inclined. That's true 11 to the number 44321. Um, thank you in advance. <laughs> Uh, you know, for all the work the people behind the scenes do here at True Theater, uh, they don't often get a chance to come in front of the camera. Tonight, I wanted to give them a chance to do that. Uh, so I asked uh, our folks behind the scenes tonight if they have a, a one-minute memory, something that they'd like to share about a dog in their life. Uh, the first 
folks, first folk, first friend behind the behind the scenes who's going to do that tonight is my friend of 30 years, Annette Uchu, who just came on the camera with me. Um, we've also worked, besides being friends, on countless theatrical productions together, aside from True Theater even, and she's just terrific to work with. And I'm, I, I can't tell you how happy I was when she said she wanted to work on True Theater and, and how like much happier I've been <laughs> since, in fact, she started doing that. Ladies and gentlemen, Annette Uchi. Annette, what's your one minute dog memory? Oh, after all that embarrassment, but thank you, Dave. I love you too. Mm. Um, I want to talk about my dog, or I should call it, say daughter, Saki. Very quick little story about when I got her. I had been raised with dogs, but when I got out on my own, living on my own, I never got a dog. I worked all day. I didn't think I could take care of a dog. My sister had a dog. Uh, it was Saki. Got her as a puppy. I did visit up my sister quite a bit. She lived in Columbus, saw Saki a lot. At one point, my sister was transferred to San Francisco and couldn't take the dog with her. So she gave it to her best friend, George, who also lives in town. I even went over and visited a couple times just to see Saki. Uh, but a couple years after that, George was transferred to Seattle. So there was a big phone conversation going on. And that, can you take Saki till we can figure out what to do? And I was very hesitant because how am I going to take care of a dog? I work all day. Now, I do have a roommate that could help, but I couldn't expect him to do everything. But eventually I gave in and said, OK, I'll take her in until we can arrange to get her out to California. Well, George brought Saki home to my home. She comes in. For some reason, she seemed a lot bigger than I remembered. It made me a little bit nervous. Haven't lived with a dog in a long time. And I was like, well, okay. And for a couple of days, we kind of tiptoed around each other. I mean, I fed her. I talked to her as much as I could. I was nice. She didn't do anything. She was very quiet, didn't eat a lot, was happy to go outside. But the second day after I had gotten her, I'm sitting, sitting on the sofa, on the very edge of the sofa, watching TV, and all of a sudden she just walks over and looks up with me with her beautiful eyes and puts her paws up on the sofa and continues to kind of force herself into that little crook on the sofa. And I'm kind of scooting over. She's 60 pounds, by the way, scooting over, scooting over. And then all of a sudden she's laying on me and she rolls over with her tummy up in the air so I started petting her and she's just happy as a clam. And I, I tell you, that was it. That dog was going nowhere. She was staying with me. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm gonna share a quick picture of her, a couple pictures Please. of her for just a moment. Mm -hmm. Isn't she ah, gorgeous? Yes. Let me take yes. it down. What kind did you say she was? She Well, she's a mix. She mm -hmm. had Labrador Retriever. We saw, um, German Shepherd, and we think she had some Terry or her ears. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, Great dog. So thank, thank you for you letting so me share that. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for sharing. And I really appreciate that. Uh, folks, right before I bring up our third storyteller tonight, uh, I just want to let you know that after her, there will be a brief four minute intermission, uh, a chance to stretch your legs, refill your drinks or snack bowls, maybe text True 11 to 44321, or just sit back and listen to the musical stylings of Aaron Bates during that time. Uh, there will be another contest up on the screen for those of you in the Zoom audience, uh, so you can participate in, the, and in that as well. But first, our third storyteller tonight is new to Cincinnati, having recently moved here from Milwaukee, like during the pandemic recently. She is excited to finally start experiencing the city with her husband now that they are vaccinated. By day, she leads the marketing department of a large corporate law firm, to overcome her fear of public speaking, she began taking improv classes, which led to stand-up and now storytelling. Please welcome Julie Cole. As long as I can remember, my children have wanted a dog. One day, when my son Ben was probably four, we were on his way to daycare and we were stopped at a stoplight. 
he was strapped in his little car seat and he was just staring out the window at this man walking his dog. And he turned to me and he said, why can't we have a dog? Now he did ask this question almost daily. And I calmly repeated the answer. I said, honey, you know why we can't have a dog. Mommy is allergic to the dog. It will make me sick. He didn't say anything. He just turned and continued to look at the man and the dog. The light changed, we pulled away. And then he turned back again and he said, well, when you die, can I get a dog? Yeah. After I dropped him off at daycare, I cried all the way to work. I mean, we were incredibly close. But he had asked a lot about a dog, but he had never asked about my death, which made me wonder if someone said to him, Ben, you can have a dog or you can have a mom. He might need a moment to think about it. The other thing that I didn't fully appreciate at the time is I was taking the fall for our lack of a dog. I mean, sure, I did have allergies and they were somewhat severe, but I knew people with allergies who had dogs. I mean, there were medications for that. The real reason we didn't have a dog was because my husband hated dogs. As long as we were going to be married, there would be no dogs. Well, in 2004, I didn't want to be married. It had nothing to do with dogs and everything to do with his Jekyll Hyde personality and the effect that it was having on me and the kids. Now, as far as divorces go, this was a messy one with all the trimmings. Ben was now 14, my daughter Abby was 10, and I was consumed with guilt because I couldn't shield them from the chaos. So to balance the drama, I tried to do little things. I left work early, I made their favorite meals, tried to play more board games, but they had a better idea. One night they came into my room and they said, mom, we need a dog. A dog will keep us company while you're at work. A dog will teach us responsibility. And I thought, a dog, that is a brilliant idea. I was all about creating new beginnings and a dog seemed like the first step. But we had some complications. We did need a hypoallergenic breed and that very much limited our options. And then secondly, the divorce had decimated my finances. I couldn't afford a hypoallergenic pure breed. But then Bate and a friend intervene. She had a Wheaton Terrier, which is hypoallergenic, and it was having puppies. She talked to the breeder and they agreed that we could have one of the female puppies for free if we agreed to have a bred in the future. We instantly agreed. After much deliberation, we named her Zoe and we brought her home when she was 10 weeks old. Now, since we had never really had a dog, we didn't know what to expect. For me, it was sort of like bringing home another newborn, the lack of sleep, the constant pooping and peeing, but a sudden love so deep it surprises you. I knew that Zoe wasn't going to erase Ben and Abby's sadness, but I was hoping she might minimize it. And in that first week, I saw what happened. Zoe was distressed being away from her mother and the litter and was whining and barking and Ben and Abby surrounded her crate. They did everything to make her feel comfortable and adapt. And she did. So suddenly our house just has this new energy and life to it. We have a dog, we have a purpose. And then it all changed in an instant. It was a Sunday afternoon. The kids were in the living room with Zoe playing. I was in the family room reading on the couch. Zoe comes running down the hallway, scampering into the family room. She comes to the couch and she starts jumping, insistent that I get up. Well, I leaned over to scoop her up into my arms at the same moment she jumped. And that's when I felt it, the piercing pain of her teeth in my lower lip. Now, it wasn't a crime scene, but there was red, sticky blood everywhere. My face, chest, the, the couch, the floor, in Zoe's black muzzle. The kids were old enough to drive, or excuse me, the kids were old enough to stay home, but not to drive. So I just grabbed a roll of paper towels to compress the bleeding, got in my car and drove to the nearest emergency room. It was about three hours later, I arrived home to a hugs and kisses from Ben and Abby and a very sheepish welcome from Zoe. They had cleaned up everything. 
Zoe, all the blood. If it wasn't for the four stitches in my bottom lip, you'd never know anything had happened. It was about dinner time then. So I put a pot of spaghetti on to boil when the doorbell rang. I looked out the window and I saw two police officers standing on our front porch. And I thought, hmm, maybe there's been a burglary or something. So I opened the door and the older officer says, ma'am, we're here about the vicious dog attack. And I was like, vicious, Z Zoe? I tried to explain that Zoe was just playful and this was a freak accident, but they were having trouble hearing me with my swollen stitched lip. But then my head began to spin. They went on to say that it is the policy of hospitals or emergency rooms to report any dog bites. And it was the city's rule to euthanize vicious dogs. They wanted me to surrender Zoe right there. I could hear Ben and Abby's muffled cries in the other room. My own throat was starting to get really tight and I don't know how I did it, but I convinced them to come back tomorrow. When I got to Ben and Abby, they were distraught. Ben declared if they killed Zoe, he would kill himself. And Abby said, we should all just run away tonight. And so we just continued to squeeze in between them. Now, I knew that Ben wasn't suicidal and that Abby probably wouldn't run away, but I had seen those two kids smile more in one week than I had the entire year. And there was no way anybody was gonna take away Zoe. So I called off work, took a vacation day the, the following day, because I knew I had 24 hours to solve this and I enlisted my village. I called the breeder, I called the vet, I called my friends, we did internet research and we found it. The provision that said that puppies under 12 weeks old were exempt from the statute. Zoe was 11 weeks old. So I faxed because this is 2004 and we still faxed the fine print to the police showing them how Zoe had escaped her near death experience. After that, things calmed down. Zoe calmed down, we calmed down. Um, the divorce was over. My ex moved out of state. And the kids were home alone more, but I didn't feel like they were home alone. They weren't really home alone because Abby called me one day at work. She had just gotten home from school and she was crying about some mean girl drama. And my first instinct was, oh, I need to leave to be there to comfort her. And she said, no, it's okay, mom. I'm here with Zoe. We're cuddled up on the couch. Okay. We did honor our commitment to have Zoe bred. And while we didn't get to keep any of her puppies, we got to watch her mother them. I started dating and Zoe was my protector because dogs are the best judge of character. Zoe and I both liked Tom. Now Tom had had dogs growing up, but didn't have one right now. So he welcomed Zoe with open arms. He did many things to win my heart. Taught Abby how to drive when she was 16, helped Ben tie a tie for a senior prom. But picking up Zoe's poop without ever complaining, that really sealed the deal. So Tom, Zoe, and I got used to married life in a quieter house because at this point, the kids had uh, graduated high school and were off at college. It was just the three of us and we had a nightly ritual where we would take a, uh, have dinner and then we would take a walk. Now Zoe at this point is getting old but people are still confusing her for a puppy because of her playful demeanor. Until last year, Zoe had a stroke and she couldn't walk or stand. We were all surrounding her at the vet's office, the complete blubbering mess. I looked down at the table at this furry 35 pound body and I thought we are losing so much more than a dog. I mean, sure, we had saved Zoe from the biting incident, but for the last 15 years, she had saved us with her comfort and companionship. She had this innate sense to detect sadness. She could hear the slightest quiver in your voice and she'd be right there by your side. And if you would let her, she would lick the tears off of your face. But today there was a flood of tears and she couldn't comfort us and we couldn't save her. We all felt helpless. She looked up with her warm brown eyes and they locked mine. 
And I thought, I just need to say it. I need to let her know. So I told her how much love she had brought to our family, how she had helped us heal. And it was okay to go. I said, heaven was waiting for her with this big green field and grass that she could roll in. And there would be plenty of fuzzy blankets that she could rearrange. And there'd be an endless supply of liver sausage and salami. And then I leaned down and I kissed her one last time. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Julie. It sounds like Zoe was as lucky to have you as you were to have her. Uh, folks, we're going to take a brief four minute intermission, give you a chance to stretch your legs. For those of you in the Zoom audience, there's gonna be another contest on the screen, uh, but whatever you choose to do for the next four minutes, please do come back because we've got two more stories for you, more news to announce and more prizes to give away. We'll see you in four, thanks. <laughs>
Thanks, Thanks once again, Aaron Bates. Ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to introduce you to Rosie, our poster dog for the evening. She's truly been a uh, ray of sunshine in our house ever since we got her, particularly during the last year and change. I'd say about the only time that she's a little pain in the tuchus is at the end of the night when she starts whining because we're trying to settle down and watch TV and, uh, and she just wants to play, but uh, she's about two and a half, so teens, am I right? <laughs> I almost called her Zoe. Oh boy. This is Mike Rosie. Hello. Say hi to the audience. Okay. Goodbye, Rosie. <laughs> She's going to go look for mommy. Uh, folks, before we resume, I did want to tell you more about uh, our upcoming season uh, this year. Uh, our next show and our final show of season 11 is True Neighbor. We're bringing that to you on Thursday, July 29th. Same exact format. In fact, the Link to register for it is live on our website right now as of today. So you can start registering now to attend that event, event also absolutely free. Uh, once our season is over, we do have a one-off show that we're bringing to you sponsored with a generous grant from the Arts Wave Pride Committee called True Voices, our first in what we're thinking of as a True Voices series. This one subtitled Behind the Rainbow Curtain. It will have an LGBTQIA plus theme. And so we're looking forward to bringing both of those shows to you, but that True Voices show is going to be a hybrid show. We're going to move into a venue at the Woodward downtown where we will have all our storytellers speaking before a limited audience and we will also be live streaming it and we will still be able to give it to you for free thanks in because of that generous grant uh, by the Archway Pride Committee and also some other grants uh, uh, some other donations including donations from people like you so we're looking forward to those and if you're interested in telling a story at either of those two events there are multiple ways you could submit to hear from you. First of all, for the True Neighbor event anyway, we'll probably have a live pitch night like we did for this show where people will pitch their stories in short five minute spurts on a live event like this that people can attend uh, from which we will draw most of our stories. Uh, you can also reach out to us through our website at truetheater.org where you will find a share your story page and there's a contact form on there. You can tell us about your story there. Or you can call this number at the bottom, which I'm only going to briefly tell you is really not the best way to go about it. I don't know why we still have that on the screen. Do it one of the other two ways. That is really much better. But you can call the number. It's, it works, you know. But uh, if you don't absolutely speak your email address clearly uh, or your phone number is somehow not showing up for us, we, we may not be able to reach you back. So really one of the other two methods is better. But submit your story. And even if you don't have a story that fits one of those two themes, uh, we are in the process right now of thinking about the themes we will choose for season 12. And sometimes if we know we've got a really great story that we need to get on our stage uh, real quick, um, maybe we'll just put a theme into the season that that story would work for. So even if you have a story you just think we need to hear, submit it at least through our website so that we have it on record. And um, who knows, you may end up dictating the themes for season 12 with your uh, story submission. And listen, speaking of season 12, boy, it's kind of weird, isn't it? Do we do it live and in person again, or do we wait? Well, we don't know the answer to that question yet. We know we're gonna have to make it soon, but uh, we are interested in those of you sitting here in the Zoom audience, we're about to pop a poll right there up on the screen. This is anonymous, it's completely anonymous, but we are asking uh, if you would let us know uh, how what your comfort level would be to attend the first show of season 12, which is likely to be at the end of October. Uh, you could choose, I'm ready now. I'll definitely be ready by then, pend in the unexpected. Can't be sure, ask me again later, okay. Not likely or no way. Uh, we'd really appreciate your responses. We'll probably have an email go out to our mailing list with a similar question soon, but we're just trying to see what way people are leaning right now. Uh, <laughs> this is anonymous. You're not committing to how you would feel at the end of October. This is merely some sort of forecast that, you know, best guess really, uh, but your answering of the poll will help us tonight. Um, and while you all are filling that out, I'd like to take another opportunity to do a one minute memory, this time with our musician tonight, Aaron Bates. Um, Aaron originally came to True Theater I met him because he was a friend of a brother of a friend, and now I'm proud to call him 
uh, an immediate friend of mine, and I can't wait until uh, everybody feels comfortable enough we can have he and his wife, Julie, over to um, finally sort of break the fast of not socializing. Uh, meanwhile, hey, Aaron, uh, you have a one minute memory for us? I do, I do. So I have a dog now, but I wanted to talk about the first dog I had as an adult. My wife and I, when we were first married, we got a beagle. His name was Bandit. I don't know if we can see that. Bandit was great. He was adventurous and he got out of the yard constantly. And I had a big backyard and an older house with a big backyard and really bad fencing. So I spent a lot of time constantly repairing the bottoms of the fences and trying to put rocks up and anything I could to keep him in the yard because he escaped all the time. Um, and it got so out of control that I finally like went off the deep end and I went to the hardware store with some friends of mine and we got railroad ties, which weigh about as much as a car. And we lined them up on along the whole fence line thinking that this was finally going to keep Bandit in the, uh, in the yard. And within a very short order, he not only got out, but we never saw him again. So I, and we looked for months and it just, he was gone. So every now and then I like to think that he's still with us because he was so determined and so strong and so agile that I just feel like he, he's still gotta be uh, lurking around somewhere. Anyway, that's my story. Great, uh, thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, that actually, it's funny, my father is in the Zoom audience tonight and that has to remind him of a dog we had named Achilles. Uh, his method to get out of the backyard, however, was to jump over the fence. So uh, we couldn't build the fence higher. So my dad tried to train him out of that and um, there really was no doing that. And we had a big to do uh, one day when he jumped and didn't come back for a long time. <laughs> but uh, thank you for that, Aaron, really appreciate it. Um, well, thank you for that story, and thank you, everybody, for taking a moment to fill out that poll who did so. By the way, folks on Facebook, uh, you're free to answer to that question. Obviously, it won't be anonymous if you do, but if you want to tell us which way you're leaning at the moment, how you see a show toward the end of October playing out. Do you think you'd feel comfortable entering a venue to watch it, or do you think no way, or are you just not ready to make that decision yet? Um, any, any sort of kind of forecast you can make about that will help us uh, as we consider how to plot out season 12. All right. Hey, it's time to get back to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, our fourth storyteller tonight is a writer and performer from Cincinnati, a city that he reminds me is in Southwest Ohio. While his writing projects include theater pieces, a graphic novel and sketch comedy, he works professionally as a freelancer, editing both video and writing. Once upon a time, he had another job, however. Here to tell you about it, Ben Dudley. How's it going? going? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, my, my name, name as you heard, is Ben, and I am um, a, a guy of some sort, and I am here to tell you a story about dogs today, surprisingly enough. Um, I have a lot of experiences with dogs, but oddly enough, I've never owned one myself. Uh, I've actually, the last eight years, I've been pretty much a full-time pet sitter, dog sitter, dog walker, house sitter, you know, a variety of things. Uh, some of the dogs, I, I just stop by to feed them or give them a walk. Some of them, I will stay at the house for a week or a month. Uh, it's a lot of different things. I like it. It keeps me on my toes. Uh, but that's actually probably the reason why I've never owned a dog myself. <laughs> it's like once, you, once you've picked up poop for money, it's really hard to go back to doing it pro bono. <laughs> so I'm fine not having a dog. I got whatever this is. Um, but... Uh, this might surprise a lot of people who have seen me uh, on stage before, but in actuality, uh, I'm a shy little boy. <laughs> and you want to know how shy I am? I didn't even mean to do that. It just happened. True story. No, I, I've always been very shy ever since I was a little kid. Uh, very, very terrified kid in a lot of ways. But it's only recently that I've connected that shyness to the anxiety that I 
uh, have, have dealt with in a very real way as an adult. I know it seems like they'd be connected, but I just never kind of connected point A and point B, if that makes sense. Um, but it's funny because the last couple of years, I've been doing a lot better with my anxiety and my mental health. And that kind of gave me the clarity to, to notice a correlation. Uh, and if you don't know what correlation means, it's like when two things correlate, if that makes sense. Uh, so my last eight years have been my latest bout with anxiety. And my last eight years have been my pet sitting career. And I know you th you're thinking like, wait, are you saying that dogs made you anxious? I mean, don't dogs act as, you know, emotional support animals? Don't they calm you down? And it's true, they do in a lot of ways. And I use the dog sitting as a way to kind of retreat from dealing with people. Plus, you know, you come up with some new ways to be anxious when you're watching animals. Like every time I drive back from the store, I'm convinced the dog has burned down the house and I'm gonna be in trouble for it. That's just how my mind works, if you're curious. Uh, but the, the, the correlation that I'm talking about between my pet sitting career and my anxiety career is actually very helpful to me because it's kind of allowed me to hold up a mirror to a lot of my own anxieties and a lot of my own coping mechanisms because some of the dogs I've watched so many times that I've actually gotten to know the dog really well. So I know their fears, I know their anxieties, I know their illogical thoughts. And I've noticed that there are three dogs that perfectly encapsulate the three phases of my anxiety. And side note, I love imagining my ancestors who fought so hard to survive just rolling in their graves because I'm up here talking about the phases of my anxiety, but you know, let's go with it. So I've had three long-term phases. Uh, when I was about, you know, two to 10, I was just your average shy, quiet kid. I, I didn't want to play with other kids. I didn't want to go places. My Legos were at home. So I was all set. Yeah, you know, I was just a scared kid. Everything scared me. The school book fair every year was like the scariest day of the year. I don't know why, but this reminds me of a dog that I watched for quite a while named Waffle. Now Waffle, I would just go over to Waffle's house twice a week and sit on the couch for two hours so Waffle didn't go, well, basically she could tear, tear the place apart if she was alone. So I was just there to sit there and calm her down. But she was just, like young me, the thought that anything could go wrong meant that everything had already gone wrong. So she just started from a, a place of fear because she would sit next to me for 10 minutes and then for the next hour and 50 minutes, she would go hide because she knew that I was eventually going to leave and that was scary. Uh, so that's kind of how her brain worked. Uh, and I was like that up until I was 10, I just did anything I could to escape having to interact with people or, or go anywhere. I kind of came out of it though, but in not the best way because in my teens into early twenties, I became, and I'm sorry to swear, but I became kind of a jerk. Uh, I just got very confident. I got, it, it was kind of like, I, I, I was like, oh, I'm shy. No, I'm going to go the complete opposite way now. And this uh, wasn't too fun. I, I was kind of a jerk. And that reminds me though, of a dog that I watched for about the entire time that I was pet sitting named Rexa. She's not a jerk, mind you. I love Rexa, but she is pure id. You know, she was constantly living in the moment, whether she was sunning in, in the grass or she was grabbing a rodent and flinging it across the yard, which she was very good at. Uh, she was just always in the moment. And <laughs> let me give you a picture here. She was a mixture between a Jack Russell Terrier and a Beagle. So she was about this big, but she thought she was about 10 feet tall. Um, my favorite, my favorite thing I ever, I ever saw was when I opened the back door one morning when I was watching her about 5 a.m., there is the biggest buck you've ever seen before. And Rexa charges directly at it as fast as she could as if it's not 40,000 times larger than her. And I, I really have to give it to her for that. That is uh, very impressive. But eventually I did kind of come around and notice that my own id, my own living in the moment was still just me being anxious because I was still dis distancing myself from people, whether it was like ironic detachment or um, just me being too cool or me being smug or whatever, I was still avoiding people by pushing them away. Luckily, I moved on. Did Rexa move on? No, she stayed the same way her entire life, but that's good. You know, she can get away with stuff because she's a dog. I'll let her have that one. I still win because I got thumbs, so, you know, whatever. <laughs> now, uh, so the last dog that I'll talk about here actually sums up my last, uh, my last, 
I don't know, five to 10 years because anxiety has come back and, and affected me in some ways, but I've also changed in some ways. So this dog is named Max. And uh, I know what you're thinking, a dog named Max, right? But there is one. Uh, Max has uh, an, an illness called megasophagus, which I know sounds good. Like if the vet was like, hey, it's your dog's esophagus, it's mega, you'd be like, all right. But no, it's, it's, it's not a good thing. Basically, he can't swallow. He needs to let gravity completely do all of the work in terms of swallowing. Now, what does this mean for the pet sitter? It means that I had to sit him up in a little chair, strap him in, let him eat, and then hold him still for a half an hour or else he'll die. Fun, right? But it was fun. I mean, they made they had fun with, they made the chair kind of look like a little throne, which I'm sure he really appreciated. But in a lot of ways though, he was, he was kind of a king because at any other point in history, if you were a dog that couldn't eat, it would just be like, oh, that dog's dead. But Max, Max was doing pretty good actually. But the thing was, he was terrified of getting in the chair. He was terrified of me holding him in there. I mean, obviously he didn't know what it was. He doesn't know what he has. He just thinks he, he probably wakes up every morning like, oh, I'm so glad I have a normal esophagus, but he doesn't. But the thing was, he was scared of everything. Like if I tried to take him for a walk, he would hide everywhere. He wouldn't want to go. If I tried to let him out to pee, he would pee inside. And I think it was, it had a lot to do with, he was very coddled because he had this illness. So his owners were very, very careful with him in every single way. And they knew exactly how to placate him in every way. And that's kind of been what I've doing, what I've been doing for the past decade or so is, you know, finding ways like, okay, I have to work, but at least I can do my freelance stuff alone, or at least I can just work with animals all day, you know, finding ways to avoid addressing my, my anxiety. But the, the fun thing about Max was I watched him for about a week the first time and it was a nightmare. He didn't want to get in his chair, but I came back about six months later to watch him for like a long weekend. He was a pro. Like he would just get in the chair. You could tell he didn't like it. He was still kind of scared, but he didn't struggle with it at all. He, he was brave on walks. He, he was better at going to potty outside. I hate that I say potty now, but I'm a dog walker. But he had improved in so many ways. And I didn't expect that because, I mean, they had had him for a long time before I first met him. So it wasn't that he was just new to the chair. But I, I realized what it was. He had more pet sitters and more dog walkers than me. And they didn't know exactly how to coddle, coddle him in every way. So he, he, didn't, he just had to accept like, oh, okay, well, I have to get into this chair. This is what I do. This is how I eat. He accepted it. Like he still didn't understand why he was in the chair, just in the same way that when I am anxious, I don't understand why I'm anxious every time. It's just a feeling that happens. But like if that dog who can't even eat can get over that and be a big boy and not a shy little boy, like maybe I can do it too. You know, I mean, Rexa never changed. You know, she was always very impulsive. Uh, Waffle never changed. I'm 100% sure she is terrified wherever she is right now. But Max actually did change and he made stuff work. And am I saying that Max changed my life? No, it, it's not that simple. But Max actually kind of gave me some clarity. Max gave me a new perspective on some things. And I do think that in the last couple of years, I have gotten a lot better about dealing with my anxiety, about accepting things that are happening and just being like, well, I mean, this is going to happen no matter what. I might as well deal with it. I don't need to hide necessarily. Hiding is still fun, but I am progressing. And I do think a lot of it is because of the clarity that the dogs have given me and the fact that they gave me a job when I was feeling a little less than social. And Max actually left me with something that I've carried with me ever since then. Um, <clears throat> it's this sock. Uh, I don't know whose sock it is exactly, but you know, it's more of like the thought that counts. And I really appreciate that. So Max, if you're watching and, and you're alive, uh, hi, uh, thank you. And, and for all of you also, thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, folks, before I introduce our fifth storyteller tonight, I just want to announce the winners from the contest at intermission. Uh, there were four of you who got all five correctly. Uh, Bruiser from Legally Blonde being the most frequently missed. Uh, we randomly chose two names of the four of you to give the mugs to, and they are Karen Pitts and Amy Steer. Congratulations, we'll be in touch with you about getting you your mugs. There will be one more contest at the very end of the show, basically on your way out the door as we're all logging off for the evening. So stick around till the very end. You will have a chance to uh, enter your answer in the Q&A and we'll have to just get in touch with you after the show is over when we figure out who wins the last contest. But stick around for that, please. Meanwhile, our final storyteller tonight is the co-founder of three story-driven organizations, the Rebel Pilgrim Creative Agency, uh, Bespoken Live, which produces storytelling shows much like ours, so be on the lookout for those, and The Hit Game, which I bought my own copy of, Good and Gooder. You should check this out, it's a lot of fun. Uh, he and his wife, Leah, have three kids under 10 and one adventurous hound dog, maybe two adventurous. Please welcome Brad Wise. When my son was three, he used to do that things that kids do exaggerate about nightmares. And he wasn't having the middle of the night, real nightmares that I definitely have empathy for. He was doing that, I can't fall asleep in the first two minutes, so I should probably go bug my parents kind of nightmares. And so after a week of him coming downstairs with these imaginary terrors, uh, I said to him on a whim, you should take Lola, our hound dog, up to bed with you. Hound dogs, they ward off nightmares, I told him. Especially long, floppy, half basset, half knows what hound dogs. And to my surprise, he bought it. And that night when I went upstairs to tuck him in and there was a little love, my heart just kind of melted a bit because for me, there's something about a boy and his dog. And that was the night that they two, they became buds. For seven years now, Hank and Lola have been sharing a bed, but Lola at age 11, she's starting to show her age. And some nights, if we took her on a long walk that day, she has a hard time getting those long bones up the stairs and Hank has to brave the night alone. It's both sad and sweet to watch him pat her on the head and tell her it's okay to stay downstairs. But oh, Lola, she's not completely broke down yet. If she catches a whiff of something, there's no stopping her. Too many times to count, she's escaped through our backyard and left the, uh, through the open gate. And then typically Hank has to lead like a search committee with his uh, neighbor friends to go find her but she always comes back, that's Lola's deal, uh, after she's smelled what she needs to smell. And our favorite place to take Lola is to my family's cottage at Rocky Fork Lake. It's like Disney World for her because we just let her roam. It's all hills and woods and she can just roam smelling whatever it is she wants to smell. And she'll come back after a day long exploration and she's just covered with that like stinky, smelly tar slime that dogs get into. And it's always in those moments uh, that young Hank renounces his companionship and I, as the dad, am forced to clean, them all, clean her off. February of this year, when it was, we had all that snow and it was cold, uh, if you're in Ohio and you remember that, um, we went to the cottage uh, with my uh, brother Brent and his family. My three kids and their cousins, they've never experienced Rocky Fork Lake uh, when it's frozen. And so we put on, uh, on a Saturday, we put all of our snow gear on and we trudged down the hill to see if the ice was thick enough to play on. We're in like a long skinny cove where our, our docks are and Lola, she didn't wait. She just burst out, ran across the ice following some scent. I went down, I tested the ice and it was thick enough for at least a car to drive on. I mean, it was real thick. Uh, and the kids just ran out excited to be uh, playing on top of the water that they're usually swimming in. They were inventing all kinds of games that uh, probably was gonna result in concussions. And meanwhile, Lola, she was just out on one of her walkabouts, uh, nowhere to be seen, pretty typical. 
Uh, and now because I'm a, a dumb adult in that moment and I have a hard time just enjoying the actual moment, I checked my email on my phone and someone sent me a message that uh, frustrated me a bit. And so to blow off steam, I decided to go on a quick hike. I wanted to see if the, the main part of the lake was frozen once you got outside of our cove. So I, I went up a hill around the bend. It was probably about a three minute walk from where we were with the kids. Um, and maybe about a half a mile from the cottage or so, maybe more. And that's when I heard Lola whining. I didn't see her anywhere, uh, but I went running down towards the lake, went off the path and down the, it's like thick vines uh, and, and thorns. And when I got to the bottom, uh, I saw Lola there treading water, trying to get back up onto the ice that lined the shore. She's about 30 yards out in the open water and, uh, the edge of the lake was frozen and she couldn't get her like long body up on the ice and she just kept treading water and she just kept whining and staring at me. And I didn't know what to do. Uh, I looked around for a branch that may be long enough, but there's nothing anywhere close to how far away she would or was. And I knew the ice would break if I went out to get her, but I thought that it would be shallow enough that I could just touch and then just like smash through the ice. <laughs> like, I don't I don't know. So I start walking out um, and I'm hearing the ice crack. And when I get about 15 feet away from the shore, I just fell through the ice right through a hole and I, I couldn't touch. It was so deep. So I'm treading water with all my snow gear on, uh, boots, coats, uh, the, the whole thing. And I'm making sure that I don't go under uh, the ice. And then I got real wide and I pulled myself up onto the ice. Um, and got on top and then just like army crawled, slid on the ice back to the shore. And I just kept telling Lola to hold on, just hold on. So I called my brother uh, up at the cottage, thank God for <laughs> waterproof iPhones. And I told him to bring rope. I told him Lola fell in. Again, I didn't know what else to do. I, I honestly knew the rope wouldn't work, but we had to try, I had to try. Cause she just kept staring and whining at me and clawing to get up. And then I had the idea that if I could go get something that floats like a canoe or something back at the cottage, and then if she could just tread water until I got back, maybe I could float out and get her. And so I just start running back to the cottage and it felt so far and I felt so heavy with water. My brother Brent, he comes running down the path. I try to like, he has a ski rope. I try to explain to him where Lola was, but I was breathless and I'm pretty hopeless. And he takes off running. And meanwhile, our kids are right there. They're playing, coming off the ice and they're starting to get scared and confused. Hank says, why are you running? Where are you going? Um, and I, I just didn't want to tell them. I, I didn't want them as scared as I was in that moment. I didn't want them running off to see it go down of what I knew would go down. And so I just kept running and I made it up the hill, the last hill to the cottage, just as this contractor showed up to quote a job at our house. And this poor man had no idea what he was about to get into, what was about to happen. And he tried to shake my hand and, and I and introduced himself and I just gasped and I said, I'm in the middle of an emergency. Can you help me? Can you help me get this canoe? Meanwhile, Brent's back, uh, he found Lola. He, he got the ski rope out to her, got it right in front of her. And he just set, kept saying, grab it, Lola, grab it. And of course she, she did it because how could she, right? But she just kept swimming in the freezing water. So Brent did the very thing that he knew he shouldn't do. He saw the hole that I fell through. Uh, and so he started to army crawl out on the ice and he made it just a little bit further than I did. And then he fell through. So then he told me he got wide. I don't know, <laughs> maybe we saw the same video on how to survive falling through the ice and he pulled himself out. And when he got to the shore, he told me he just laid there and he kept saying, I'm sorry, Lola, I'm sorry. Because like me, he thought for sure Lola was gonna die. While that was happening, I was running back through the woods, dragging this 200 pound canoe that's made of fiberglass and wood behind me up and down the hills. The contractor in his jeans and work boots, he ran after me. He still has no idea what's happening. It was the most exhausting and hopeless thing I've ever done. But I kept thinking about having to tell Hank what happened to his dog if Lola didn't make it. So I just kept, I just kept going.
the contractor, he caught up with me and helped me get the canoe up the very last hill up to the top. So then we took it down the path to get through the thorns and the vine and the, that stupid, way too big, way too heavy canoe just kept getting stuck in the things and the, the contractor bit it. He fell hard as we just pushed and pulled that thing down the hill. And I could see through the, trail, the trees that somehow Lola was still alive. And at that point, best guess, she'd been treading water for, I don't know, at least 35 minutes, maybe more, because who knows how long she was there before I found her on that hike. But we managed to get the canoe all the way down to the ice, and I just flopped myself into the canoe. And I couldn't breathe. And I honestly, I didn't have anything left. But I started to push out and then con the contractor gave me a big push and the ice broke and the canoe just fell down in the water. And then I just paddled all the way out there, 30 yards to get Lola. At that point, I grab her with my left hand, but I'm terrified of the canoe capsizing. So I put my right hand on the, on the right side and I pull Lola, she's 60 pounds, she's long and plop her into the canoe with me. And she's whining and she's shivering, but we did it. I don't know how, but we did it. And from the, the shore, the contractor, he yelled out, he said, catch your breath. Everybody catch your breath. My brother was there and we all just tried to catch our breath. But what I knew is that we didn't have much time. I was really nervous about Lowell. We had to get her back and get her warmed up. And so I got up, I turned around in the canoe, trying not to capsize it again. And my brother, Brent, threw the ski rope out to us and he pulled us back in. We got to the shore, got Lola out, and the contractor, unaware of his amazing comedic talent, uh, timing, he said, fellas, I gotta be honest. That's the first time I ran in a long time. And I had no reason to doubt him, but man, am I forever grateful that he showed up and had the heroic kindness to just run with me. I never, I know for sure, I never would have made it back to get Lola in time with Adam. So we got back up onto the path and then somehow Lola managed, she had the energy to just stumble the half mile back. She just kept running and stumbling and I was jogging behind her and I just, said, I just kept saying, you can do it, Lola, you can do it. Keep going, keep going. I was just, I was, I don't know. I was scared that she's gonna collapse. I didn't have the energy to carry, carry her anymore. And I was terrified she was gonna get hypothermia. And what's crazy and truly terrifying is that just a few days after that, this experience that I'm telling you about, two people died in the same lake in the ice. And I had no idea uh, how close we were in the moment. Um, we didn't realize it. All I kept thinking about the entire time was I don't know how I'm gonna tell Hank and the kids that their dog died. When we finally made it all the way back up to the cottage, we got inside and the kids wrapped Lola in towels and we put her next to the space heater right in the bathroom. And Hank, he laid down with her on the linoleum floor, kind of just draping his body across from her. And he kept saying, you're okay, Lola, you're okay. You're gonna be okay. And amazingly, she was. Man, I've been holding my breath for a long time listening to that story. Thank you so much, Brad. I really appreciate that. I am so glad that everyone, uh, including and especially Lola, are okay. Um, that is just amazing. Folks, it's time to thank all our storytellers who joined us this evening. Uh, Chris and Scott, Julie, Ben and Brad. I want to give another shout out to Annette and Jackson running the show behind the scenes, Aaron Bates for playing music all night long. And uh, this lovely list of people you're about to see on the screen, it truly does take a village. Every one of these people, whether or not they even realize it, 
uh, contributed to helping make this show happen in some way. And I'm certain also some folks that I managed to forget to put on the list. I apologize to you if you are one of them. Um, uh, but thank you all so much. Notice at the very end of that list, if you're reading this, you, you are on the thank you list. As I mentioned earlier, it does take two people to tell a story, one person to actually tell it and another to listen. And tonight you listen and for that, we are grateful. Uh, for those of you in the Zoom meeting tonight, stick around to the very, very end. There is going to be one more contest on the screen. We'll be up there for about a couple minutes. You'll have a chance to answer it, so do that on your way out. We'll email the winners about theirs. Uh, meanwhile, thanks to everybody also who contributed, donated to True Theater tonight by texting TRUE11 to the number 44321. It's uh, not too late. And even if you're watching this in replay, you could still do that, and even the, the replay links will be on the screen a little bit later. Um, Hey, here's hoping that we see you all uh, at True Neighbor, uh, possibly at our True Voices show, Under the Rainbow Curtain, and maybe in season 12 as well. But whether we see you virtually or in person, sooner or later, until next we see you, be true. Mm -hmm.